Poet, The Remarkable Story of George Moses Horton, written and illustrated by Don Tate. George loved words. He wanted to learn how to read, but George was enslaved. He and his family lived on a farm in Chatham County, North Carolina, where they were forced to work long hours. There wasn't time for much else. Besides, George knew his master would not approve of his slaves reading. But that didn't stop George from admiring the language that was all around him. Inspirational words that read from the Bible, hopeful words delivered in a sermon, lively words sung in songs. George was determined to learn how to read. When white children studied their books, he lingered nearby. He listened as they repeated the letters of the alphabet. Soon, George could recite the alphabet himself. His mother would have liked to help him, but she couldn't. Instead, she gave George one of her most valuable possessions, a Wesley hymnal, a book of songs. It was George's very first book. He scanned the pages, trying to make out the letters. It was no use, though. He could not read the words. Then George found an old spelling book. It was tattered and some pages were missing, but it was enough to get him started. George thumbed through its pages. He recognized some of the letters. At night, when he should have been resting after a long day of work, George studied by firelight. His eyes burned from the smoke. Soon he could make out a few words. Before long, he could understand entire sentences. Over time, George taught himself to read. From that point forward, George not only loved words, he could read and understand them too. George read verses from the New Testament. He read books, newspaper articles, advertisements, whatever he could find. Most of all, George read poems. He loved beautiful poetry. From early morning until late at night, George tended cattle on his master's farm. While he worked, George composed his own poetry, mingling his words with the tunes of familiar songs. He hadn't learned how to write his poems down yet, so he committed them to memory. Words and rhythms were stored up inside his head. His verses swayed with emotion, like the music of Sunday services. They kept him strong as he grew to be a young man. When George was 17, his master decided to split up his estate. He divided his possessions, land, cattle, wagons, tools, among his family. Slaves were considered to be property too, so George's family was separated. George was given to his master's son. He feared he would never see his mother, brothers, and sisters again. George toiled in the fields of, on his new master's property. It was disagreeable work, but he found a little relief on Sundays. On that day, George walked eight miles to the village of Chapel Hill to the campus of the University of North Carolina. There he sold fruits and vegetables grown on his master's farm. He didn't mind the long walk, though. George welcomed the opportunity to get away. At first, the college students teased George. To distract himself from their insults, George recited his poetry. Words sweet as the fruit piled high in his cart sprung from his lips. Every eye grew wide and every mouth fell open at the sound of George's voice uttering beautiful verses. The students were awestruck when they found out that he had composed them himself. News of the slave poet raced through campus like a brisk flowing river. Students swarmed in close to hear George perform his verses. Some of them decided to help George. They gave him their books, English grammar and dictionaries, history and oratory, classical literature and poetry. George soaked up these new subjects like a sponge. One day, a student requested a poem for his sweetheart. George created a verse for the woman. He dictated the poem to the student, who wrote it out neatly. The young lady swooned when she read it. After that, other students wanted George's poems, and they were willing to pay for them too. George composed more than a dozen love poems a week, selling them for 25 cents each. Some paid him with fine suits and shoes instead of money. In time, George dressed as sharply as the students themselves. With money, nice clothes, and newfound status, George felt freer than he had ever had in all of his life. But he was not free. He remained the property of his master.
George continued to work on the farm during the week and visit Chapel Hill on the weekends. The story of the slave poet reached the wife of a professor, Caroline Lee Hintz, who was a professional writer and published poet. George's poems affected her deeply. Some made her smile, while others made her cry. She sought out George and taught him how to write his poems on paper with a pen. After so many years of memorizing verses, George could now write them down. Caroline arranged for George's poems to be printed in the Gazette, the newspaper of her hometown Lancaster, Massachusetts. Now George was a published poet. His poems protested his enslavement. No other American slave had done that before. Soon, George's work appeared in other newspapers, including Freedom's Journal, the first African-American-owned newspaper in the country. George's heart could barely contain his growing pride. With money from his writing and odd jobs, George was able to pay his master for his time so that he could live in Chapel Hill and work as a poet. It was an illegal arrangement, but his master didn't care. George was now a full-time writer, but he was still not a free man. In time, George published The Hope of Liberty, his first book. He wanted to use his earnings to purchase his freedom. When editors at Freedom's Journal learned of his plan, they tried to raise money to help him. Influenced people joined the cause, newspaper men, a college president, a governor. They offered a great deal of money, but George's master refused to sell his valuable slave. George was devastated. Meanwhile, abolitionists in the North worked to end slavery. They published books. They printed posters and pamphlets. They blanketed the South with their calls for enslaved people to rise up against their masters. Slaves who could read told others their message. As a result, more slaves did fight back, and some even killed their masters. Fear ruled the South. New laws were passed in North Carolina. People who printed and dis distributed anti-slavery materials were penalized. Worse yet, it became illegal to teach a slave how to read or write. Now, it was too dangerous for George to write poems that protested slavery, but he didn't stop writing altogether. He, bu he published his second book, The Poetical Works of George M. Horton, which contains poems about life, love, death, and friendship. In 1861, war broke out between the North and South, mainly over the issue of slavery. Most of the students went off to fight to defend the South. With few people left on campus to purchase his poems, George had no way to earn money to pay for his time away from his master. He had to return to the farm. The Civil War raged on for four long years. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln set the nation on a new course by signing the Emancipation Proclamation. That soon led to the end of slavery. At the age of 66, George was finally free. Now that he was a free man, George no longer had to remain on the farm. Later that spring, he packed his pens and paper and left. George went west with the Union Army, camping along the way. He wrote poems about his travels, about his family and friends back home, and about all the things he had experienced in his long life. George's love of words had taken him on a great journey. Words made him strong. Words allowed him to dream. Words loosened the chains of bondage long before the last day as a slave. The End